Hello and welcome back. We are now entering early childhood in our course. Chapters 8, 9, and 10 will be covering early childhood. Chapter 8 will be biosocial development, 9 will be cognitive development, and 10 will be psychosocial development. All right, let's get started. Biosocial development in early childhood. Well, let's start with some body changes. The average child in the U.S. will grow about three inches per year between the ages of two and six years, and they'll gain about four and a half pounds per year for those years that are encompassed. That's a lot of gain. Two, three, four, five, six is five years. So you're talking about a child who's going to be on average 15 inches taller than they were when they started this period, and on average 22 and a half pounds heavier than they were when they started this period. So there's a lot of growth going on. Um, now, of course, children grow at different rates that are appropriate for their genes and then what is going to be their ultimate size, things like that. But these are average numbers. And these are important because they allow us to identify children who maybe are having um, growth delays for one reason or another. One of the things that drives me nuts is there's a commercial for Pediasure that says that the child has fallen behind the growth chart, so mom starts pumping them full of Pediasure. <laughs> um, as if bigger is always better. Bigger is not always better, but it's a mistaken belief that a lot of parents have, that um, if their child is not above the 50th percentile, then they're a runt, or they're too small, or they're not healthy, or something like that. We have to be aware that the growth chart runs from, you know, you can be in the zeroth percentile, which means you are, there are no children who are smaller than you. And you can be in the 100th percentile where you are bigger than all the kids except for yourself. Most children are going to be somewhere between 25th percentile and 75th percentile. 25th percentile means that the child is larger, either height or weight, than 25% of their peers. 50th percentile is they are larger than 50% of their peers, and 75th percentile, they're larger than 75%. Most kids are going to fall somewhere between that 25th and 75th percentile, and that's healthy. Now, if we look at adults, there's a range of heights, right? And most people will hover around the averages for their sex, but some people are significantly smaller and some people are significantly larger. A lot of it's determined by genes, some of it's determined by environment, but I, I'm mentioning all of this because I think uh, that in general, parents put a lot of emphasis on wanting their kids to be big. And big isn't always better if it's not what's in your genes. You may end up with a, a child who has gained a lot of weight, but it doesn't boost their height. And so now you have a child who weighs too much for their height, and that's not, that's not a good um, thing in the long run. And then also we can, um, start to get into like food battles with our children and that's not a great thing either. All right, I will talk a little bit more about eating in another, a little bit, a few more slides, but let's return to some terms we've been talking about for at least three chapters of biology and that would be cephalocaudal development and proximodistal de development. We're gonna continue to see this pattern. I, I mentioned before, this is gonna be the pattern that we see up until the child reaches puberty. So we're going to see that um, development starts at the head and works its way down and that it starts the, in the center and works its way outward. Um, so that's gonna persist. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about nutrition. In developing and developed countries, overfeeding is much more common than underfeeding. Um, I think there's a really profound fear that a child will not be getting enough nutrition and parents really worry about that. Grandparents really worry about that. And so um, what we can end up with is children who look like picky eaters. I don't want to eat what you've put in front of me. I mean, I don't know a lot of kids who, with given that child's size and then how much is on the plate and it's all vegetables and I mean, I, I don't know which kids wouldn't be labeled picky eaters in this, you know, context where there's nothing to dip it in or anything to make it palatable to a child's taste buds. Um, but a lot of times what appears to be a picky eater is a child who isn't really hungry come mealtime. And that um, means that they probably were consuming snacks in between, things that were more palatable to them. They filled up on juice or milk and uh, they can get they they can survive without having to eat the things that that they don't really feel like eating that don't look appealing to them 
first off, I'm going to make the apology part for children, which is that vegetables on average have um, compounds in them. Not all vegetables have them, but for example, broccoli has them. Um, I think green beans have fewer of them, but uh, there are these compounds that are bitter. And to us adults, the bitterness might actually taste kind of good. You know, as we get older, bitterness tastes better to us. And that's why adults are more likely to like things like coffee or beer, things that are high in bitterness, whereas children will reject those kinds of foods or drinks that have a lot of bitterness in them. So Brussels sprouts are a great example of a, of a vegetable that a lot of children reject because they do have a lot of that compound that tastes very bitter. Um, children are more accepting of things like carrots or um, green beans and peas have a lot of the sweetness in them and children have more sweet receptors, uh, have more active sweet receptors, I should say, so that it only takes a little, it takes, um, you know, a lot for them to say that is too sweet for me. Um, whereas an adult, a lot of adults say that's too sweet for me. I, I happen to have a really bad sweet tooth, and so for me to say something is too sweet is almost like a six-year-old saying it's too sweet. It's like, okay, that must be really sweet for me to have, have rejected it on sweetness. Whereas with a, a child with bitterness, it only takes a hint of bitterness for a child to detect it and then reject it. Um, so a lot of times picky eaters are really a function more of how the taste buds are set up. Um, sometimes it's habit though. Sometimes we've gotten into battles with our children where we say that they have to clear everything that's on their plate and the things that they reject, we say, oh, well, they just don't like those kinds of things when they may have just been full. Um, so we, we sometimes get into these um, just right tendencies in children where they're like, well, it's too warm or it's too cold. It's too bitter or it's too sweet. It's too chewy or it has a weird texture or it's, you know, it needs to be just right or I'm going to reject it. The more that parents get into battles telling their children that they have to eat everything, the more likely the just right tendencies will emerge where the child is like, well, I can only eat certain kinds of things. Um, so one of the best strategies that parents can adopt when trying to ensure that their children eat a wide variety of nutritious foods is to first off be aware of what a serving size is for a child. So this changes as they get older. So what I always recommend that you use is the palm of their hand as the measure because their palm of their hand will be a ratio to their size. So you give them a palm of, your, of their hand size serving of whatever you're giving. So for example, in this child, the pile of green beans should contain maybe five green beans. And you know maybe two carrots would be a serving. Maybe one of those broccoli florets would be enough. Not sure what the yellow thing is. I mean, it kind of looks like French fries, but maybe it's, you know, summer squash. I don't know what it is. But anyway, they've given them too much. Um, and actually, given that all of them are vegetables, probably one of those things is enough. Maybe two vegetables is enough for a child. Um, so one of the things that's really super important is to start with a serving that is appropriate for the child's size. And uh, if they complete that and want more, terrific. If they complete that and they don't want any more, terrific, right? Like they ate what they should have eaten. Um, if they reject what is an appropriate size for them, it's time to reflect about, well, what did they, how recently did they eat before this meal? What else was on the plate? Um, sometimes we give our children too much variety on the plate and they can focus their attention on the parts they like. You know, maybe they just want to eat the mashed potatoes because they like the gravy on it, or maybe they just want to eat the chicken nuggets. Or um, my granddaughter went through a phase where she would literally just dip her finger in the ketchup and eat that. <laughs> and uh, we'd all be like, well, let's not give her any more ketchup. But it didn't cause her to eat the stuff that we thought she was going to dip the ketchup in. She just wouldn't eat because she wasn't hungry. We kept feeding her too close to dinner. And so once the um, last snack of the day was placed earlier in the day, suddenly she's hungry at, at, at dinner time and she's more willing to eat things. Picky eaters are oftentimes a manifestation of parental fears, right? Parents are worried that their children are going to be malnourished and maybe not grow as big as they could or have as elaborate of a brain as they could have or other kinds of signs of malnutrition. And, you know, in our ancestral history, this has been a very persistent and consistent concern. I mean, it really is. And it makes sense that even in modern times when we really in the U.S. probably don't need to worry about children getting enough um, calories and things, um, it still is, you know, part of our ancestral history. And so we want to protect our children from malnutrition. So it makes a lot of sense that parents worry about this stuff. Um, one of the problems with these eating battles and especially the development of just right tendencies is that you can end up as an adult having these weird 
um, you know, foods that you won't even try or um, sort of negative feelings about meals or in fact if you've ever seen an ad for Noom, N-O-O-M, it's a um, supposedly psychology based diet program. I just saw an ad for it the other day where the person had this great flash of insight when he realized ever since I was a kid I've been conditioned to clean my plate. Um, a lot of kids are conditioned to eat clean their plate and uh, I think that's why it's important to for parents to completely be aware of what a serving size is for their child and make sure that you only put what their child should be eating onto the plate. And then if the child asks for more, then go ahead and give them another serving because that way you get into fewer of those clean your plate battles. If you've given them what's appropriate for their stomach to hold, it's more likely that they will in fact clear their plate. Um, so we don't have to set up lifetime patterns where they're eating past fullness in order to satisfy the demand of cleaning your plate. So, uh, those are all basic, um, you know, nutritional issues, things that are um, ongoing. Most parents don't need to worry about malnutrition or underfeeding their children. Today, our biggest concern is overfeeding our children. And uh, we've got children in the two to six year age bracket in the U.S. today who are meeting the criteria for obesity and, you know, too high of a BMI and those kinds of things. And this is new. It, you know, hardly, hardly any children... 50 years ago would meet that criteria and today we're having a significant portion and so that's that's not healthy and not good and, and we're going to talk across adolescence we'll talk about how um, early obesity can have big impacts on adult health so uh, we'll come back to that in another chapter for now let's go ahead and stop here and we'll pick up in the next segment we'll talk about brain development